<laughs> and then he says, thank you, yeah. fan fam. Yeah. I hope we see each other again soon. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think I've ever cringed so hard in the history, in the history of... of Internet non apologies, apologies, oh, as we sometimes call them. Yeah, um, just, oh, but that's it's all right, really, because um, that apology will soon only be available. There is an actual apology that he's issued. Yeah, it will only it will only be available to the person who buys it as a non fungible token. A non fungible so, token. Yeah. Uh, nonsense words now have in extreme. I don't. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, nonsense words have always had a huge financial value because the financial system is entirely based on nonsense words and terms. Exactamundo, um, baby. Uh, listeners, if you could explain NFTs without making it sound like it's a scam, um, try it. BigDamnContact at gmail.com. I'm genuinely yeah. interested to hear if anyone could explain it to me in a way that will not, at the end, make me go, so it's a scam. Inquiring um, minds want to know. Yeah. We, could we take a moment's silence then for uh, the original upload of Charlie Bit My Finger, which, as of the past couple of weeks, was purchased as an NFT. Um, bequeathing the family who uploaded it with a decent amount of money. So good. Yay. They should be rewarded for making us all laugh mm -hmm. for over a mm -hmm. decade. Um, after having filmed their drug-filled child after a dentist appointment or whatever it was. I can't remember. Someone bites a finger. Drug-filled child after a Friday afternoon on the sauce. I don't know. That, that, was, all the, that was all the viral videos 10 years ago. It was, yeah. this person's just got back from the dentist and now they're a unicorn. Blah. This person got back from the dentist and now they're miming to Usher or summer. I don't know. Like that—that that was it. Uh, that, that was the internet ten years ago, boys and girls. And if you don't Chipotle. remember it, you ain't old enough to listen to this shit. So please, well, please go away. Um, I think mean, the rest you of could you have blocked it out. But a lot of that stuff, you know, the memories of the internet ten years ago is now only available as an NFT. So yeah. only one of you has it. You can't blockchain that out anymore, no. baby. No. Yeah, it's. I just. I never understand it. Um, I mean, we could do an entire episode on the Doctor Who Worlds Apart card game thing. That shit is um, gross. <clears throat> but uh, I'll just leave it at this. Uh, I was involved potentially in a marketing campaign for it, and they fudged up explaining to me so bad what the basics of what it all was was yeah. that my my scam senses were tingling, and I was like. You know what? No, I'm not gonna. No, no. Thanks for your time, but bye. And then since more infos come out, I'm like, yes, yeah, a scam. Yeah, it's a scam. It's a multi-level marketing scam. The, ma the makers not. will tell. The makers will tell you it's not. But um, the makers then have to explain why Chris Eccleston, his agent, turned down a chance to have his likeness be used in the game. Because it's a scam. Hmm. Come at me, bros. And uh, um, Christopher Eccleston has strong scam senses. Yeah. <laughs> it's his scam sense is tingling I just want to point out everything I've just said is alleged okay so um, I love that word have you ever said a word so much on the internet that it alleged. loses all meaning allegedly anyway, um, welcome to the big dank we're not quite awake yet uh, my name is Christopher this coffee's not strong enough Johnson my name is uh, Matthew <laughs> Watson. Ah, my favourite lyric. Yeah. From Corn, but in acoustic. Hema. Have you heard the cover of Another Brick in the Wall? Yeah, it was. Uh, yes, uh, it was. It was on the Great Corn Greatest Hits Volume One. Very strange cover, but mm. better than Doug Walker's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you could apply that to anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'll tell you what, I had, I had a, a, such a satisfying shit this morning. That's <laughs> better than Doug Walker's. <laughs> Put it on you. Yeah, that should be <laughs> every. <laughs> Every uh, brand that's now getting renamed because of racism, as well it should be, should just be given the tagline, better than Doug Walker's. 
Né? Não, my microphone just tried to dive off the table, sorry. Microphone stands at drop of the uh, drop of the uh, the drop of a hat. Better than the uh, walkers. walkers. Um, I like how I use drop twice there because I'm, my brain's not fully active. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like the drop of the, the drop of a of a drop. Oh, drop. he's trying, boys. Drop of a girls. drop, drop, drop. Drop, 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 drop. Oh God, we're punchy this morning. Let's get. Let's talk about something. Yeah, let's um, talk about why it's the morning. We're recording on the morning. Oh. Um, we don't normally record in the morning, but you know, free time is as free time does, and is where we are. And I slept till about. Let me check. Uh, fifteen minutes before we started uh, our call. Yeah. So, and I was only up about twenty minutes before that. Yeah. So, so. we're not exactly. Um, Firing on all cylinders, as of which I suggest that you all just just get out of here. I mean, I don't think we've been firing on all cylinders for nearly five years, but here we go. Here we go. Some could argue that we never even, like, set up the cylinder. No. We've been firing, but, like, it's not been going anywhere. It's just just splurging outwards. (laughs) Like like pissing through a a sieve. It's just sort of, like, shooting in all directions. We are the leaky bilge pump. Of pop culture podcasts, um, we, <coughs> we we are the shit. We are the shit. Sans fan of pop culture uh, okay. podcasts. We're yeah, just okay. throwing shit at you. Yeah, we're just right. throwing shit at you. But it's better than Doug Walker's. Yeah, we um, cut out the fan. We go straight to this. <laughs> no middleman. This shit comes straight to you. Um, <laughs> we're like the most organic podcast. <laughs> yeah, literally. Home grown on the rain. Home brewed, fresh from the bowl. <laughs> dirty, uh, dirty so... bastards. All of you. All of you, but we appreciate you, so thanks for coming. Um there was we're gonna a... have a, chum- a chumwag about video games soon, but first we are, we are. Oh, we're have a segue. About video games. Segway holes. Segway holes. Um Cinemas <laughs> are opening up again. Hole. Yeah, they are. And That's with the them, they're doing. And with them, films are coming out again. And we got a full trailer for one of those films, The Eternals, Marvel's The... Is it Marvel's The Eternals or Marvel's Eternals? It's just Eternals, I think. Just Eternals. Film. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the comic series I'm familiar with is is The Eternals, the Neil Gaiman run. That's yes. the one I've read. Um, Which so is, of like, course, a reboot of the Jack Kirby The Eternals from the mid-70s, which is after we came back to Marvel from DC. Mm-hmm. And just basically did another version of New Gods. Jack, we'll give you some more money, mate. Great. Um, I mean, I've got no ideas anymore. Cool. Just whatever you want to make. Well, I guess I could do that, but just draw it different. Yeah. I mean, that's we're, not, th- we're not shitting on Jack. Jack Kirby was the king for a reason, but that is pretty much what happened here. But I mean, he had he had very sort of like strong interests in certain. Like fictional tropes, like the idea of like ancient alien, ancient ancient godlike aliens, and, uh, and you know he definitely read Chariots of the Gods a couple of times. Um, and God so just that's was the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, that's why we got just a tip. That's why we got. Um, but what a tip! Yeah, that's why we got New Gods and the Eternals, which are both very, on the surface at least, very similar properties. Um, but the Eternals. Is way more niche and way less well known, and the new gods aren't even that well known, outside of Dark Side and maybe Mister Miracle. Um, so, yeah, we got a trailer for it. Chloe Zhao now Oscar winning Chloe Zhao. Yeah, show getting <clears throat> showing off uh, cinematography in the Marvel universe. Who'd have thunk that they have cinematography in the Marvel universe? Looks looks gorgeous. It looks really pretty. It looks like Don't you know. could play it on a giant screen in the lobby of a business and it, you'd be satisfied and calmed down. Like, the receptionist presumably isn't or wishes to be. Like, it, it just very... If I could make it into a series of screensavers, I would. Yeah. Don't know what it's, it's about. Just like, this looks really cool. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, <laughs> it's super vague. All it really... All, the only suggestions it gives is, hey, these guys exist. They've lived among or alongside us for the you know millennia forever basically and yeah. now might be a time for them to intervene with humanity's uh, progression and, and and say something and then at the end of the trailer they give sort of one little scene to really ram it home to the audience that no no this is set in the same world as those other films guys this is it's part of the MCU 
where they have a chat about like, oh, well, now that Iron Man and Captain Rogers have gone, it's kind of cute that it's not Captain America, it's Captain Rogers. Because Captain America yeah. has not gone. There is a Captain America. There is a Captain America. Um, now that Iron Man and Captain Rogers have gone, like, who should who's going to lead the Avengers? And uh, I can't remember who it is, but one of them's like, I could do it. They're like, <laughs> it's um, Richard Madden. <laughs> so uh, the fact, Icarus. So the, oh, it was Icarus. Okay. Yeah. Ha <laughs> So the fact controller, you are wrong. Like it's just it's, <laughs> it's, it's 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 a cute little gag at the end, and and I, do you know what is kind of sweet about this? There looks to be a lot of stillness, at least based on the trailer they're yeah. giving us. Yeah. And and that's kind of unique for the MCU. Like the closest we've had to that. Really? Um, in a long time, the MCU, the, the idea of stillness is a couple of scenes here and there, you know, like Drax and Mantis's like sort of moment in Guardians 2. Yeah, and, yeah. And um, some more of the stuff with just like Peter and Ned, the smaller scale stuff in, in and, and, and like Scott Lang's home based um, antics, the Ant-Man movies. But like, you know, not since maybe Iron Man 2 where we got more of what made the first one work, which is scenes where Favreau's gone. Here are the bullet points. Okay, Robert and Gwyneth, <laughs> improvise. And you just get some of the most like organically fun, natural scenes in the whole of the, the saga in, the, in those two movies because of that. Um, where it's just like, they're having fun. They're trying to make each other laugh, yeah. but also not like distract each other from the purpose of what they're filming. <laughs> or or as, as Mark Kermo described the dynamic on those Iron Man movies. <laughs> What we ne- what we didn't realise at the time was the voice you think he's assigning for a character is actually for the opposite character. Uh, did you see he reviewed Peter Rabbit 2 last week? No, inf- I haven't. Infamously, I'm... when he reviewed the first one, he talked about how much he really disliked it, but especially disliked James Corden's performance as Peter Rabbit. Yeah. And then the next week... James Corden's dad wrote an email in. Oh, to complain. Oh, he get his dad to tell off the nasty man. Well, it's because he he's a regular listener to to uh, Simon Mayo's show, so he was he was like, oh, this is you know, it's kind of upsetting to hear someone insult my kid on on the thing, and it's like, and Mark Kamal basically responds with like, well, you know, I'm sorry if you felt upset, but you know, I, that's that's my job. To, to yeah. critique a performance and I found a routine. He reviewed Peter Rabbit 2 last week and it was not brought up at all. <laughs> um, probably because he feared the wrath. Feared the wrath. Of, of Corden Sr. James Corden's dad. Meanwhile, is James Corden's dad going to get in touch with everyone on the internet who watched the Friends reunion? <laughs> not me. I didn't watch it. I didn't watch it, but the, the, the Twitter sphere was alight when the, when it came out. Like, the day before, the day of, and the day after, Friends was trending, like, worldwide all day. And various names and characters from the show were trending worldwide all day. But attached to all those trends was James Corden, because he hosted the Friends reunion. Good. Not and, good. Um, it was a mix of tweets of, you know, hey, so why is he here? He's the worst choice for this. He's the worst person. Mixed with tweets like, why does anyone hire this guy? Yeah. <laughs> like, for anything ever. He's um, shit. The thread that we once devoured on a podcast from Reddit um, oh, got, yeah. got dragged back up, which is kind of nice to see. It's very good. It's a very good thread. Um, Excellent. It's, it's a Excellent beautiful thread. thread. But one thing I've noticed as well is Directioners, uh, and to an extent, some BTS fans have like adopted Corden as a lovable side character because he's friendly with some of One Direction. Then it's, and uh, it's also because it's he's, all the, he's had BTS on the show a couple times. It's also the carpool karaoke thing in it as well. Like that's got a weird following. Yeah, despite um, being you know kind derivative. Of, cheap and derivative yeah, yeah. And, um oh but it's charming it's only charming if it's organic and natural and fun like when they're making whole half hour programs out of it instead of it just being yeah. a fun recurring segment i mean no one you know you know no one fun. makes things joyless and repetitive and sucks the fun <laughs> out of them quite like james corden um <laughs> <clears throat> so i suppose that's on brand for him in a way in a way in a way 
Uh, sorry, for those who just tuned in, who maybe like uh, nodded off on the bus after the play started, welcome back to the Big Damn James Corden's a Fuckwit podcast. Yeah, yeah, hello. Um, um, hi, everyone. <coughs> uh, hi, our, hi. Our, our, our motto is and always has been, Ruth Jones is better. <laughs> um, so... She doesn't like it when you say that, though. Doesn't she? She looks after a mate. That's fine, but she is better. Yeah. Like, that's like saying, oh, I don't like it when people tell me water's wet. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, a hydrophobe. Ruth. I'm sorry, Ruth, but uh, water is indeed wet, and 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 you are the wettest water of them all. You, oh, s- you, you're refreshing and and replenishing, and can be sculpted into a swan at fancy dinner parties. Oh, struth, Ruth. Str- um. <laughs> <laughs> you like that, didn't you? I'm going to take another swig of this coffee. Um, oh, fuck. I'm going to tell you that I went to the cinema yesterday. I went to an what? actual cinema. What the living Billy Ho Hum Hey Ho Hum Hey? I you went to see the... Peter Rabbit too. Did you? I didn't see Peter Rabbit too. I did take a small child to the cinema. Oh well, not so small anymore. But um, and hey, hey, you're you're a man. <laughs> Every <laughs> child is small in comparison. Yeah, that's true. Um, and <laughs> uh, we watched uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. Oh, ninch, 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 ninch. Um, oh, that was what a good reintroduction to uh, to the big screen. Y- yes, I assume <laughs> it, it was very good. It was very good. Uh, I'm not going to talk about its uh, perceived similarities to other um, East Asian inspired entertainment franchises because I don't want to get cancelled on Twitter. Um, but <laughs> it's it is it is very don't good. Even it's got to be started on that one. Mm, oh god, it's got a it's got a hell of a cast. It's. Um, it's a lot of fun. It hits you in the, all the feels. Um, all the feel holes. All, all the feels are going to get hit. Not right quite, in their not holes. Quite, Next um, segue holes. Not quite in a Pixar uh, manner. It's not quite that... Uh, yeah, that's. The, I think that's... Emotionally that con- manipulative, I'm going to say. Confused um, me a little bit on its release was like... And this is more just a sign of my age, I guess. But like, I saw it coming out on Disney Plus and I was like, oh, right, it's the next Pixar movie. Mm. No, like no, Disney have been doing CGI films solidly now since 2011, and you know it, you without can de- fail, <laughs> the the animation in this is some of the best they've ever done. Like CG wise, it's just the character work particularly is really incredible. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of there's a lot of non vocal acting from the characters. Yeah, that the the animators have, have done. Just a stellar job on. Nailed perfectly. Yeah, perfectly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it is a it's a really high quality, solid Disney animated movie. It's two thousand and twenty one. What do you expect at this point? When was the last time they made a bad animated movie? Like they're on a hell of a streak. <clears throat> true, true. I mean, there there have been ones I haven't cared for, but they've not been bad films. Exactly. Like, yeah. I didn't. I, I I had I had issues with Frozen two, but it wasn't bad. I, I have issues with the first one. I mean, I just, I just think it's. I think it's more. I think it's way more boring than the internet built it up to be. I was like, it's this. It's not all that. This there's a good message here, but also like, at expense of anything interesting happen? I think there is a degree of projection uh, of the audience onto some of that stuff um oh true I, especially when it comes to the second there's the whole about aban- you know the, the abandoned but not even confirmed love interest idea in the second yeah one, it's yeah. like no offense uh animators but like surely some of you must have picked up on what the audience did surely <laughs> some of you one. must be lesbians too um <laughs> It's Pride Month. Give us Frozen Two, the gay cut. Yeah, thank like you. just just go all out, please. It's about time. And, and, and you, you know what? <laughs> There's a lot of lesbian undertone, queer baiting stuff in Raya and the Last Dragon. Oh, is it all baiting or is it speculative? Well, I suppose it's not baiting. Like it's not. It's just the way that it is written and the the sort of relationship of those two characters is presented. Oh, it's like, oh yeah, and it's I suppose so... it's where they're gonna sell it overseas and everything too. Yeah, and, and there's wanna... no oh, like God. this. This you know, there's a there's a this is sort of the relationship between the two female uh, main characters in that film could very easily be interpreted as something uh, platonic or something romantic, and neither of them has a male love interest. 
at any point. Yeah. Um, which is good because it doesn't bog down the plot with anything like that. Yeah, um, that's, some, that's something that has been interesting about like a lot more of the recent output. Is, yeah. Like, I, I don't hate a Disney romance because I think they do it well enough that I can't come out of it going, oh, it's predictable because I'm usually like, no, it was charming as fuck. But like, it is nice that they're mixing and matching when it comes to the Walt Disney Pictures proudly presents canon. Yeah. Like, whether or not a love story is indeed it would integral be... to the story they're telling or not. They've gone like, sometimes they've just gone, no, nah, it ain't. Like, Wreck-It Ralph. Like, no. Like, but why, why shoehorn one in here? It doesn't need to be here. You could also argue that there is a love story in Rare and the Last Dragon. It's just unspoken, like because of, because of the way that it is pitched and played. Yeah, it, it could go either way with it. So it's it's one of those. It's one of those. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if they weren't worrying about what one of their biggest box office um, uh, countries was thinking and just like made it less unsaid at the last second and confirmed it in some way. Wouldn't it be nice if we were bolder? Um, <laughs> and didn't pretend that gays don't exist because of the Chinese market. <laughs> it's, oh, it's just so... It's beautiful. Beautiful work. Uh, it's, 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 it's mad. It's just... It's, oh, God. Because, of course, of course, uh, with Cruella having come out, I'm so glad that wasn't your first jaunt back to the cinema because the things I've no. heard about this movie make me think that everyone... And if, if you are one of these people and you think my take on this is wrong, please let me know politely in an email. Politely. But I I'll think tell that, you you're wrong. Uh, no. I think that everybody who has come out of Cruella this past week going, oh my God, that was brilliant, just what I needed, trip back to the cinema, is just happy to be back at the cinema. Yeah, I and think there's a lot of that going around. they're loving it. Because every plot detail that has leaked or been spoken about of this movie just confirms to me, a person who wasn't going to see it, yeah. why I wasn't interested in seeing it. Because yeah. it just sounds like it's every... How can mm, how can we do this? Mm, how can we make a villain the star of a movie, but with oh we just don't make them the villain villain because yeah. Suicide Squad. We put it's another like, villain in it. We put a bigger villain in it. Yeah, and and then by the end she's not a villain villain. She just is a bit naughty sometimes. Oh, she's, she's a naughty like, girl. It's just like what on earth? And just I oh. Uh, the biggest thing for me is, and I won't go into do deeper spoilers for anyone who wants to go and see it, but like, cl- close up your ears for the next 30 seconds, starting now. So at the end, <clears throat> Dalmatians that Cruella owns, because she's taken them from the villain, have babies, and she gives two of those babies to uh, Roger and Anita. Who no. are in the film? Uh, Cave Cave and Novak plays Roger. Uh, they're in the movie, That's good. and they they don't like know each other and stuff because obviously they've got to have their meet cute. But in the future, but like they give them a puppy each. So those puppies are clearly going to become Pongo and Pedita, which means that Pongo and Pedita are siblings. Uh, no, no. They go they go fuck and have fifteen puppies soon. No wonder that, no wonder she has an unusually large no, litter of fifteen that. puppies. Because they've got the cousin gene. I don't like that at all. And to me, that means that like no one at any point during the development of the movie went. They're um they're related. No one said it. They all instead went through the same motion they're hoping you go through, which is, oh, and that's how they get the puppies. And it's like, yeah, through incest. No, I don't like that. It's it's fucking weird. I just. You know that you know that Cruella's mum is killed in a flashback in the opening, right? No, I, I no no I know I know. Um... Do you want to know how she's killed, Matt? Oh no, but tell me anyway. She's For the audience. Pu- she's attacked and pushed off of a cliff by Dalmatians. I'm not even kidding. Just can all of these films get in the bin? Can all of these live-action films get in the bin? I know we've given a pass to the ones that have been okay. Like Jungle Book, visually spectacular. Cinderella, harmless and very pretty to look at. And, and uh, you know, a chill time. Aladdin, we weren't as upset with it as we thought we would be. But I'm sorry. I'd like them all to get in the bin for the sake of not having any more of them, please. No more Cruella. Like, all of them in the bin. Just get all of them in the bin. Well, no the, more Cruella. Like, in other news, Joker 2 is going ahead. Ah! Um, <laughs> in other completely unrelated ah! news, Todd Phillips is co-writing and producing. He may be back to direct. Um, 
I no mean, confirmation is that what he called on... what he did on Joker? <laughs> he may be back to watch a bunch of Scorsese films and drag uh, copy paste into mm. the the edit. I mean, I, um, I, people like people like Joker, so I don't want to shit on their parade. Like people no, no, want more no. Joker. Ultimately, these are just like if you ever listen to this and you think I disagree with you lads, that's fine. It's our opinion. You have your opinion, and we're not wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. But like, I just, uh, you know, I, what? Uh, surely we've said everything we have to with Joker. Must we go Hawaiian? Must like, we it's just, topical. it's just, you know. Imagine if it is though. Imagine if, imagine if, in an homage to the Killing Joke, there's he, he wears a Hawaiian shirt in it. Yeah, and fights a Batman when uh, this Joker is clearly in his seventy. <laughs> yeah. An arthritic, arthritic, and um. What, what? The moral of the story is, oh my god, you do realise if this Joker becomes the Joker to a Batman, um, it will be the most blatant example of Batman beats up mentally ill people ever. Yeah, yeah. You, the way you, you framed this Joker, yeah. you kind of can't introduce Batman without turning Batman into the villain. I mean, Batman as the villain is not necessarily a, a, a narrative I am uncomfortable with because it's been done beautifully in things like um over the edge the animated series episode um where he's perceived as the villain yeah um um white knight the yeah. comic series the black label series which is an excellent example um but also like he's a rich white dude who beats up criminals instead of addressing societal problems yeah like there's and something he's constant, inherently he's constantly challenged by like alfred and other people like why don't you like Retire Batman and put your resources to use, like helping people that way. Why don't you retire Batman, Batman? Because I'm Batman. 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 Thank you, Superhero Cafe, for informing all Batman jokes from now until forever. Forever. Um, but what was kind of fun when Joker 2's story broke the other day is that a collective Tinternet's reaction. Apart from that hardcore um, DC film fan set who were just like, these films can do no wrong no matter what. Yeah. Shut up, Marvel piss boys. Everyone go to hell. Jared Leto is valid, etc. Um, apart from that lot, the reaction to Joker 2's announcement was, no, we're good. Yeah, we're, like we're okay. pe- from people who enjoyed it, were like, no, I think the first one did what it did, and to do more would kind of cheapen it. Um, and 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 then people like myself and and yourself who were like, we're really not that keen on this movie overall. So <sighs> nope, could we not have more of it? Thanks. But Warner Brothers took one look at the fact that it's like the first ever R-rated movie to get a billion dollars, and went, nah, we're gonna make more. We're gonna make more. We can do more of this. No thanks. Not, uh, uh, yeah, I just like. If you if you're really gonna carry on down this path, at the very least, just do do what DC did alongside uh, Brian Azzarello for a <clears> bit, <throat> and and go like, do you know what? Let's just do a story based on a villain. Do Lex. Do Lex. Do do, do Luther. And give us a, a Lex Luthor movie where, again, we're going to come out of it going, yeah, they tried to humanise an, inscru- an unscrupulous shit heel, and I don't know how I feel about it, but at least it was not Joker 2. You know, I don't know. What if it is Joker 2? What if Le- the end what, if, it, what Le- if Luther ends with <laughs> him going onto a boat... Yeah, and the the joke is there, and he says, "Well, we're gonna put together a league of our own," and then it doesn't go anywhere. What if what if it is Joker too? What if he gets on the boat and looks up, and there's there's Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, and he says, "Who are you?" And uh, he says, "I'm the Joker, baby." <laughs> and then that's the end of the movie. <laughs> I'm the Joker. I'm the baby. Joker, baby. But he's actually a Joker, baby. Oh, even better. So it's Son of the Mask. Can um, we do Joker it's just, Babies? It's Joker Baby. Baby Joker. It's Joker Babies. Baby um, Batman. Um, <laughs> Batman Babies is the next step. Did you know that... Um, Fuck. We, <laughs> do you know what? We weren't going to do much news this week, but I think we're both just remembering <laughs> shit we've read this week as oh. we started. Did you know that Lego Batman 2 has been cancelled? 
Oh, the, okay. I didn't know they were doing one, but oh, yeah. oh okay. They, they confirmed it was in development after the first, and then everything went a bit quiet because since we've had Lego Movie Two and and um, that kind of went quiet after that. But it's because the rights to the Lego movies have gone from Warner Brothers to Universal. Oh yeah, because Warner time. Brothers and just and Discovery have merged, haven't they? And yeah, so it's oh, it's, it's, it's this weird thing where like. Warner own the publishing rights to Lego yeah. as a franchise in, in, in within media. Um, Warner, of course, own DC. Yeah. But now Universal own, own the film rights to the Lego series, the Shit. Lego movie series. So they could probably go... They're probably, when they got it, were like, great, so... Um, Lego Batman 2, where are you up to? Like, let's let's get to work. Let's make this thing. And Warner's have been like, ha, 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 ha. You do realise how much more you'll have to pay us to use Batman yeah. in your movie, don't you? And Universal just gone, oh, fuck it then. Batman? <laughs> Batman, you say? <laughs> don't count on it. Um, oh, we have to just, like, not even as, like, a patron exclusive. Can we just, one episode of this, just be a Batman forever uh, um, commentary, but we'll Why never explain not? that we're doing it. Why not? We'll never tell anyone we're doing it. We're just doing it. It just happens. We're just going to talk about Batman Forever for the length of Batman Forever. It's suspiciously for the same length as Batman Forever, but it's not Batman Forever commentary. Oh, no, no. It's Batman. We just both happen forever. to have it on in the background whilst we're recording a podcast. Yeah, yeah that's how we would, That's how we do these things. Um, <laughs> let's get to the main topic. <laughs> What, bl- what, look, dilly dally, blind doodah, look. Okay. Well, you tell. You te- <laughs> do, do you remember how for like, oh, like 30 Black seconds? Two. I watched Men in Black 2 recently. That was. Why would you do. Why would you watch the bad Tommy Lee Jones movies? Because there was a child in the house and he wanted to watch something. Um, yeah, you watch Men in Black and then you skip to three. <laughs> See, and, I and, hate and, and, and if he goes, and if he goes, hang on, why is K back? You go, ah, just shut up and eat your cereal. Um, he doesn't remember who K is. <laughs> Men in Black Three is vastly superior to Two. It is, it is so much better than Two. You're the only person I've ever heard say that in my entire life. And then everyone else who said that the opposite to you is endorsing you watching Men in Black Two, and those I mean, people must be stopped. I don't get Men in Black Two endorsements, including the child. <laughs> Listen, I chuckled. I stopped. chuckled a couple of times during Men in Black too. Of course you did. You went, ah, Lara Flynn Boyle's got a prosthetic tummy. <laughs> <laughs> look at it. Look, he takes the cigarette off the CGI dude at the post office. It's like, okay, and oh look, Michael Jackson wants to be Agent M. Oh, that was uncomfortable. Yeah. That yep. was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable at the time. I remember being yeah. in the cinema in like what two thousand and two, yeah, and being like, like "Why? Why? Why?" Hmm. It, was Isn't just, it, weird? it wasn't good. It wasn't that good. Se- that series has massive gaps between releases. Ninety seven, two thousand two, two thousand three. The third one's like twenty thirteen, I think, and then uh, international, which is now uh, on uh, Netflix. Yeah, I've not seen International. So every bad thing I've heard about it is leading me to go, do you know what? <laughs> it's an hour of 40. Maybe I'll give it a spin at some point. Maybe I'll give it a spin. Give it a spin. Whilst doing the ironing or scratching my balls. Yeah, 97. Or, or taking a particularly long shit. 2012 was Men in Black 3. Ah, the year of the cat. Mm. Uh, uh, um, there's me. Uh, if you're going to watch something good, we'll t- <laughs> one more thing before we go into the main topic. Just if, one more thing. Um, just uh, one more. Yeah, just one more thing. Have you uh, se- have you seen Alistair Beckett King? He's a stand-up online. Um, recognisable by his ridiculously luscious red locks and beard. Um, the fact Alistair he- Beckett King. I've never seen him stand up nor sit down online. <laughs> He basically, I'm going to show you a picture of him, and the only way I can describe him before showing you the picture, and you can look at the picture and clarify, is he basically looks like um, if every member of Jethro Tull were folded into one being. Oh, God. Um, oh, God. Here that we sounds, go. So, yeah, it's, sounds it's horrifying. No, but, no, but like, like, you know, it, 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 not against their will. They've all chosen this. Oh, okay. That's so there he is. Makes it less horrifying. Alistair oh Beckett yeah, King. oh yeah, no. 
Yeah. I recognise that guy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Does his brilliant... Like, during lockdown, obviously, being able to do stand-up gigs, he made these really weird, fun little skits and animations. Every Friday, he releases a new sort of short, comedy short. The most recent one is the Voight, the Voight Conf test um, scene from Blade <laughs> Runner, but he's asking Mr. Blobby. Oh, God. And it's I bet that gets some interesting of, results. Oh, it's terrifying. Um, it's really scary. Uh... But he... <laughs> How the hell did I get to Alistair Beckett King here? Oh, God. God, I don't know. Oh, Jesus. There's something you said that reminded me of him and made me want to bring it up. It'll come back to me at some point. It's just... Either way, I've introduced you in the audience to Alistair Beckett King, if you haven't already seen this. St- oh, Columbo! Columbo? He oh, did, God. If Col- he did hit If Columbo Were an Anime. And it's just like a 25-second long <laughs> animated sequence. And it's... Fuck fucking genius it's it's amazing and all of our listeners of a certain age are like columbo columbo um, anime <laughs> um <laughs> um but yeah one last thing to mention before we go to the news uh bo burnham released a new special oh Netflix. bob hernham bob hernham well uh, yeah uh, uh robert burnham um <laughs> has released uh, a new special to netflix called inside which is unique in two ways. One, in 2014, uh, 2016, sorry, Make Happy was his last tour as a, as a comedian. And he made a point at the time and uh, heavily suggests it in the show itself that he's kind of done with comedy now. Like he's sort of, he's at a bit of a, partially at a moral crossroads a bit because he was starting to feel a bit shitty about the fact that he was, you know, raking in sort of thousands from a gig for doing a thing that ultimately like you know is something people go to to feel better and have a laugh yeah and we all kind of need that and but at the same time he needs to make a living but like is he making way more than is justifiable but obviously he'd become big enough that he was like hiring people for the tapings of it and all this. Yeah. So it's like he wants to make sure that he's, you know, it's, he's in a bit of a thing with that, coupled with the fact that as he's revealed since, um, he'd started having panic attacks during his show. Um, uh, or on the way to shows. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, coupled with other stuff he was dealing with, it just wasn't really an ideal situation. So he called it a day. Um, since he's gone on to direct a Chris Rock special, um, to write and direct the film Eighth Grade, which is now available on Netflix, um, uh, and and he's you know written here and there. He's like writing on a, a film script for something at the moment, which if I pull it up, I think I'll be pleasantly surprised because I remember reading it going, "Oh shit, Bo Burnham, really?" Um, but then, uh, start of last year, and he talks about this in the special a little bit. Um, start of last year he made the choice he was like i th- actually feel kind of comfortable now like I, I i feel like i'm starting to oh he's also he was also in um promising young woman recently he was he was the the, oh, okay. the, the supporting male lead in that that uh wasn't one of the people um mm. carrie mulligan was trying to murder mm. um so yeah he oh i can't find it oh he's gonna be playing larry bird in an upcoming um series about the lakers <laughs> hmm. interesting. interesting um so he's getting he's doing a bit more acting then but he uh he was gonna start up he'd started writing a show again in early 2020 he was like Do you know what i think i'm gonna i think now's the time if i'm ever gonna if i'm ever in the right mental state to give this a go again it's now and then the pandemic happened so what he did was he turned it into a project to create a special completely at home in his work shed like annex to the house and that's what Inside is. It starts out as a, oh, do you remember when we were all trapped indoors? Here's somebody making entertainment during that period. Isn't this fun? And inevitably, as a piece of work by comedian Bo Burnham, <laughs> turns into a, yeah, there's a lot more going on here and maybe I'm yeah. not okay. And it would suck to pretend that. Um, that is not to say it's doom and gloom. It does leave you feeling with a sense of like, I felt overwhelmed by the end of it. Like I, I, I felt uh, in, a, an incredible mix of emotions. Aside from this was funny, like that was one of them. But yeah, it's. I recommend it. My God, I recommend it to anyone who's willing to give it a go. Uh, if you've not seen any of his previous specials, though, 
this sort of I think it benefits from at least having seen Make Happy. The yeah, just so one. you can sort of have an have a feel for sort of the just development as a yeah as a writer I mean, like, and performer. Because like, we saw him in Shepherd's Bush, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was uh, that was between words, 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 and what, which were like his second, well, his, his first proper full on show that he toured as himself was what, what, what uh, words, 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 and what yeah. was like his first. That uh, on Netflix you can watch what make happy and now inside, um, and he was sort of when we saw him it was he was testing material. Oh, it was you, me, and Gus, wasn't it? Uh, from, yes, from uh, CBBC. Bless yes. him. Yes. Oh, I keep in touch with him uh, every now and again. He's a lovely man. Bless Gus. Um, but yeah, we uh, we we uh, what the show we saw was like a mix of stuff from words, 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 and a few things he was testing for what, um, uh, as well as a few things that never made it into the stand-up uh, show, but made it up as made it into bonus tracks on the album versions. So, like we saw him perform Nerds Live, which is a uh, which is uh, is tough. It's it's a tough one, um, and and that's a studio track on the What album. It, it never made it into any of the actual shows, but he, he played with it a lot in that period. Um, having that background of knowing him as as a, you know, really clever and inventive, but fairly crude, teen early twenties stand up. Mm. Having that context helps. Seeing that evolution in What and Make Happy. Um, where he's very much like shed the earlier stuff, not in like a oh I hate this, but in a I ah, it's kind of not my sense of humor anymore. But I appreciate a lot of you here because of that stuff. So there's still going to be the crudeness and that in here, but I'm mostly going to play with things I'd rather tell stories about now than you know. Like when I, when I went to see him do um, a version of what in Manchester uh, a couple of years after after the Shepherd's Bush one, mm-hmm. um, it was it was what. But there was a forced interval because the venue has to sell drinks. Yeah. Um, and in the middle of the second half, he added like a he did a medley of like I'm Bo Yo, Oh Bo, um, and words, words, words because he was like I know some people have like got into me because of the stuff that's online, and I haven't really been touring the UK ever. So here's like some of those songs, and it, you know it's like a thank you for waiting around thinking when's he gonna do that one <laughs> so it was like that's that was sweet of him and what was great was he said the interval we have to do the interval because uh, this venue's got to sell you drinks and normally that's not how the show goes so i don't really know what to do now um so we're just gonna end it here for 15 minutes and then uh come back and we'll carry on okay thank you everyone uh, uh still weird but uh, you know uh, you do your thing i'll i'll oh and you know everyone gives like an awkward <laughs> applause because he obviously wanted it to be kind of like a bit weird yeah and then he just walked to the back of the stage stood facing the back wall and stayed there for 15 minutes <laughs> it was fucking brilliant <laughs> it was like that is a commitment to a bit only moving at the end of the 15 to grab his water bottle go off stage clearly finish it change it to a new one then come out as the lights went down and it was like that is oh well done man oh my god well done um but yes yeah, so his new special is 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 it doesn't mention pandemic or coronavirus or anything like that it just acknowledges that this is a weird time and we've all been told to stay inside as much as possible so that's what i'm going to do um <clears throat> it, it, it he he lights it stages it directs it like a film um it is full of comedy songs obviously there's one point where he's trying to figure out at the beginning what his purpose during all this is, like, what his role could be. Like, the, the whole opening song is this bit about how, like, we're going to fix the world with comedy. And he's drawing a Venn diagram on this whiteboard where he's written Malcolm X in one side, Weird Al in the other, and they've written <laughs> me in the middle. <laughs> um... And it it, it it seemingly shot in sequence until certain bits happen... Well, later on you realise, oh, oh, that was him from like nine months in reacting to what he shot at three months in. Yeah. Huh. Uh, there's a sequence that is basically a Twitch stream. So- um, and uh, I've never felt so seen in my fucking life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, there, there's, a react- there's a video reaction sequence, which is some of the most like 
someone else would have done it as a YouTube video. It would have got like a million hits within a month. They would have made some money after AdSense stops fucking them around, and then people would have moved on with their lives. In the middle of a comedy special, it's going to live forever. <laughs> yeah. It, as a result, it's funnier because it is this genius gag um, that relies on your knowledge of internet culture and lazy content, and it's yeah, and, and the songs as well. The songs are fucking phenomenal. Um, no. <laughs> no self-respecting quote white girl on Instagram unquote will be able to watch this and not like rethink how they're posting online yeah. anymore. <laughs> well, that's um, always good. But it's uh, it's 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 a it gets tough toward the end. Um, yeah, because he is very open and vulnerable, and um, yeah, it's I but I, I encourage everyone to watch it. I really really do. Um, Bo Burnham inside on Netflix. We're not sponsored, but if they'd like to, then we'd also like a show, please, Netflix. Yeah, uh, thanks. It's about what? Baby Joker. It's about. <laughs> <laughs> no! Yes! Baby Joker isn't real. Baby Joker can't hurt you. <clears throat> I'm the Joker! Baby! <laughs> we like stories, don't we, Matt? Uh, it just depends on the story, but for the most part, yeah. Um, we like to play games, don't we, Matt? It depends on the game, but for the most part, yeah. Do you know what I finished playing yesterday, the year of our Lord, 2021? Um, Tiddlywinks. Yes. <laughs> I finished I finished the main campaign. And, uh, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Um, Extreme Tiddlywinks. You know what? That, that section in the middle where it just became a first-person shooter from the perspective of the plastic cup we're trying to get the Tiddlywinks into... Mm. That was that was I, I that was phenomenal. Like, I never see it felt, from the enemy side was very eye opening. I never felt so much like a plastic cup. <laughs> I finished Life is Strange two yesterday. Um, what? 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 Yeah, I did. Truth. What? True that boy. And uh, it's yeah. For those who don't know, Life is Strange uh, two is a game in a series of, of solo stories, basically that. Um, some would assume the second one. No! Um, uh, the uh, revolve around uh, young people and uh, it, typically in each one, one has either the social or um, investigative power to do a thing and and uh, they're with a friend or in the case of the two main titles, someone has an actual superpower and mm. you, the player utilize it or help guide the person with it through a series of situations that get increasingly more dramatic, tense, frightening, heartwarming, um, heartbreaking. Uh, the second one's about Sean and Daniel Diaz, uh, who are, uh, two, uh, American teens with Mexican heritage who, um, after a horrid incident occurs, uh, on their street, are left believed to be responsible for the death of a police officer, uh, as well as uh, losing someone in their life too. Uh, so, out of panic, they go on the run, and you are shown the older brother taking your younger brother Daniel uh, on a journey, attempting to get to the Mexican border and then get across and go to where your dad's childhood home was, Um Whilst trying to keep hidden the fact that Daniel seems to be able to move things with his mind. Yeah. Uh, and under extreme stress, uh, blow things up with his mind. There's always so a wrinkle. You're dealing with a hormonal teenager and you yourself are barely an adult and it's set in 2016, 2017, and they don't use names or specific political uh, terminology, hmm. but it is absolutely set in the 2016 we know, and you're playing an American kid whose dad was Mexican. You can see where this is going. Um, I've been live streaming this as I played it, and the first few streams got hit a lot by trolls. Yeah. Um, mostly trolls who were just using racist terminology to talk about the lead characters. Cool. So cool, this game, cool this ga meaning that th these absolute <clears throat> fucking losers are searching Life is Strange 2 streams to do that. So, pathetic. Um, Why? But also, like, it means it struck a nerve. Yeah. With racists and bigots and far-right-leaning voters and all the people that 
marginalize an attack completely unprovoked and unnecessarily uh mexicans <laughs> so yep. you know that's interesting that like it's obviously struck a nerve with people who don't stop and think why is this game depicting me as the villain maybe i should think about that um but yeah that that makes it tough the fact that it's a road trip from like seattle to the mexican border makes it tough because yeah that's a lot of ground to cover for you know like a 16 year old kid and a, a 16 17 year old kid and, and his like 11 year old brother yes um it's beautifully performed. It's uh, the stakes are never not high. Like even in the calm moments, you're aware that one wrong thing, one intervention, one person noticing that you look like the two kids that are apparently on the run from Seattle that were in the newspaper. Like it, do you know what I mean? It's it's any encounter where you have to speak to a person, you're feeling tense because you're like, oh shit, what if they know? What if yeah. they know? What if they know? Oh God! Like, I've, there's a newspaper outside uh, a gas station in the first episode, where um, it's got us on it. It's like a few days after we left Seattle, uh, and I spotted it in the paper dispenser, and you could interact with it. So, like, I paid to you know paid for the dispenser, and turned the paper around and closed it again. It's just like, nope. Do you know what I mean? Just, just like while we're there, no one can like walk past that and see that, see us. Um, so yeah, like just little things like that. But it's, it's, it is great, and it got me to thinking, sweet boy, sweet, sweet boy, sweet tasty beardy boy, um, about video games, specifically like immersive story games. Yeah, that have don shit to you. Uh, I, before we carry on, listeners mild spoiler warning we're gonna try to avoid spoiling stuff too much if we feel like the games will be better for not knowing anything we'll give you individual spoiler warnings should they come up yeah so so tread with course here but uh i mean life is strange 2 is did the ending and there are like seven variants of the ending yeah. Apparently the one I got after looking it up is one of the good ones. There's like three slight variations on the one I got and it's the good ending essentially. Well, that's good. Um, is it and good? It's, and it's still upsetting. <laughs> oh, well, that's not so good. <laughs> People get to live their lives, albeit not together. Um, oh. Despite that being an objective for certain characters throughout the game. So uh, it's, yeah, and that's the good ending. Yeah. Um, also, decisions I'd made earlier on that led to things happening for certain characters meant that those characters could be around for this ending. Well, that's which, something. Which meant more joy for the people that ended up with them and near them and living next door to them, etc. But yeah, so... Uh, but, yeah. But, the, but But the ending itself does things and, like, I might clip up my reaction separately on Twitch because, like, there's a choice made at the end that made me just... I, you have to make a choice between you know a or b at the end and both have consequences and one is better for one of you but one might give you all a chance and i'm like okay i'm going for that one and then a character makes a choice once that cutscene begins that made me go wait no hang on what no. ah! and it's just oh it's that incredible. seems that seems like a bit of a dick move on the game's part to ask you to make a choice and then the character makes another choice regardless true but the choice you make you still get to execute it. Okay. You, you still you still get to the result you're after, just not with the other person. Oh, I see. Um, I and see. and also everything that that other person does to contradict what you think is going to happen is completely in character based on how you've interacted with them and alongside them during the story. Hmm. So like you you've built them up. When I read the alternate endings, it's like oh, had I made this decision, had I spoke to them this way, they would have done this instead in the mm. scene and i was like oh okay and again i ended up with one of the good endings so i'm like okay i guess i made the right calls but also this is sad yeah. um so just to be clear we're not, we're gonna sort of not talk too much about like say action adventures or whatnot we're gonna focus more on sort of rpg story-led games um uh, stuff that like essentially is like playing i, I think i guess like playing a film or, or a tv series that kind of vibe so, like, well, I think I feel like that's a, very, a pretty narrow 
avenue to go down for video games in particular because that kind of limits you to the sort of telltale style adventure stuff. Yeah, um, well, yeah, which I mean, I, I mean, don't some... think is always the best example of that. No, true. I, I, I mean, okay, let me rephrase that. Like the narrative, um, if it's let's say if it is action adventure, the narrative's got to be one that feels like a cohesive, like whole. If yeah, that makes any sense? Do you know what I mean? Like, so I wouldn't, for example, put an Assassin's Creed game in this category because that shit rolls on forever, and there's multiple tangents, and you couldn't just sit down with a lot of the later ones and play a story yeah because it deviates so much um like even down to like choices you can't necessarily just follow the main story plot because you have to do these other things to be able to get the main story to roll Mm. but some of them take you off whereas for example like um like even arkham knight with its various deviations and offshoots and side missions you could still just play the main story if you were ballsy enough to take on the level of combat that Hmm. comes along without building up your experience, you could still play that main story and that main story takes place in one night. So it's like, here's the start of the night, here's the two, three key events as it goes on, and here's the conclusion. One Arkham Um, night, one might say. ah! Whereas if we were picking that series, I'd say Arkham Asylum would fit in this category. Yeah, no, Arkham Asylum definitely would. Um, Because it's like this nine to 12 hour... Thing. Well, it would fit in this character category, but I wouldn't give it a shout out because I don't think the story's that good. Well, you sir are completely allowed your opinion. Um, <laughs> like I don't think it's I don't think it stands with the <laughs> likes of, you know, the Life is Strange stuff, The Walking Dead, the first season of The Walking Dead. Mm. Um, mm. Well, I mean, speaking of, yeah. Mm. the first season of the walking dead how we've spoken about the first season of the walking dead everyone else has spoken about the first season of the walking dead it's there's a reason sort of people like, have spoken about yeah, it yeah it sort of became the gold standard by which narrative led adventure games are based are judged um because it was you know extremely well written and fantastically characterized and had a complete arc yeah and you know ended in a sense like they couldn't they could have not made any more walking dead games Mm-hmm. and I would have been satisfied and I was because I haven't I've, played any of the others <laughs> I've still not moved on to season 2 I own season no. 2 and I've still not moved on to it because I'm like I, I'm I'm satisfied with how that one well satisfied yeah. is the wrong word I'm satisfied with my experience of season 1 I kind of um, don't care about it yeah like I do I do want to know what happens to Clem Clementine but but that's that's the main strength of that first game so you are Lee yeah. Um, quotation marks, Lee, and uh, Lee. you, uh, Lee, 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 Lee. We're talking, talking fucking, fucking Lee. Lee. Um, Lee doesn't so, fuck in this, by the way. No, no, no. But we we had a friend named Lee, and he's the protagonist of um, of Walking Dead season one, and it's exactly what you expect. It's set during the events of the Walking Dead. Uh, Lee has been somewhere, which you learn over the course of the game as to why he's not been around. <laughs> And uh, has certain stigmas above his head, um, held above him. Uh, things he maybe doesn't want people to learn about him. But he, through his actions and through the actions you are given as options for him, he's clearly a good man. He's a yeah. good man um, who has been who's made some bad decisions uh, in his life, <clears throat> but ultimately is not, you know, not the villain of this story. Mm. Um, in a world where people are either deciding everyone else around them as a villain or are becoming villains themselves because the desperation of having to survive in the zombie apocalypse is driving people to do very extreme things. To say the least, yeah. It is is probably the closest I've felt. Because my experience with The Walking Dead as a franchise, like, I watched the first season. I didn't really care for it for a reason I couldn't quite put my finger on. Mm. Like, I enjoyed it, but then toward the end of the season, because it's only like six episodes, the first one. Um, yeah. It's like a limited yeah, short series. Season. It was basically a pilot season. Yeah. Well, like, the, the last the last episode's like in this lab where they essentially discover about it being an airborne virus, and it may have started here, or at the very least was like being experimented on here for, you know, attempts at a cure and, uh, and whatnot. I was like, okay. Then I bought 
the uh, the collection volume one, which is this giant hefty beast of a pa- black and white paperback. Yeah, it's like the first forty eight issues or something like that. Yeah, t- took it with large. me on a flight flight to America. Read like the first thirteen on the flight, and then read a boatload intermittently. And I realised why I didn't enjoy the first season of the show. It's because the first season of the show uh, adapts the first volume of the graphic novel, so like the first six issues. Yeah. But then deviates at the end into adding this science lab storyline so that in the show they can go, this is what zombies are, and this is where they came from, and now you know, we're the walking dead. Ha ha ha. Whereas the, the books don't do that. Like the the books, they never go to this lab, no. Uh, like and and learn about it. Like they learn about. I mean, so they the walking, have that. The, yeah, well, the Walking Dead of the title refers to the fact that they realize that everyone's doomed to become a walker. Yeah, everyone's, like, everyone's already gonna infected. Become a zombie. Yeah, it, it's just a matter of like it's not the bite doesn't turn you into a zombie. The bite just gets infected and kills you. Yeah, and then you become a zombie. If you die you become a zombie. Yeah, it doesn't so, matter how you die. Yeah, the first book is about Rick waking up... Rick, Rick, Rick Grimes waking up from a coma, finding himself alone in the hospital, eventually finding his 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 wife and child with a group of friends, including with... Uh, I think Shane was his neighbour or his best mate. His partner. Um, that's it. Oh, yeah, of course, because they were the uh, sheriffs, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, cops. And... Um, the stories of if Rick trying to sort of come to terms with what's happened while he's been out, because uh, for the rest of them it's been li- this has been life for like two months. Yeah, and most of America's screwed, uh, and they've heard that there's a city somewhere further ahead, but there's a checkpoint, so they're going to try and make it there. And and along the way, he realizes that Shane and his wife Lori, um, have I think it's Lori. I remember getting yeah, confused. Laurie is his wife. Is Laurie? Yeah, I think I was getting confused because yeah. Lauren Cohen plays her, and I think I was confusing myself. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, he learns that Shane and Laurie have been getting it on, and Shane gets incredibly like defensive over it, and then Shane and Rick fight, and Shane's gonna kill Rick, and then Shane is shot by Carl, Rick's son. Little little tiny son who doesn't rapidly grow old in the comics, folks. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, shoots Shane, and that of course becomes a thing that later on develops. But they bury Shane and they carry on. So volume one is basically imagine if you woke up from a zombie apocalypse, your life was completely turned upside down. Oh, and also there's a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, and and that's what makes the first volume compelling. In the TV series, they keep Shane around longer for drama. Um, yeah, and the the scene where he gets killed off is added into a later season, uh, and they make the conclusion: we found a lab, we're trapped in the lab. We've learned that this is a thingy. Bye. In the comics, when they learn about the Walking Dead, it's so compelling because like they they take refuge in a prison in the third volume, and they find some prisoners who all appear to be like there's like a group of five that are still there. None of them appear to be like really bad people. They're people who've done for like tax evasion, minor theft, drug yeah. use. Except not one of them turns out to be a serial killer who's been keeping quiet about it yep. and ki- kills two of the young characters that they've met since volume two and brought with them. And when they go to. Because then there's a whole debate of do we kill this guy? Do we throw him out to be like eaten? Like, no, we lock him up. We're civilized. Do we need to do that and the other? And then they go to tidy up the bodies of the young people, and the, the the head, the severed heads of the young people, start to move, and that's when they begin to go, wait, no, and it starts mm. to dawn on them. So the comics are slow burn, and and there's something really brilliant about the execution of the comic of The Walking Dead. It is it is like this grim soap opera that you're checking in with like once a month, um, where the zombies are the setting. And occasionally a set piece. Um, it's not about, you know, like, how do we fight the zombies this time? How do we fight, make a barrier this time? Those are just, like, things that they have to do. The human drama and the, the grim feel of it is what made it unique. Um, like, the grim inevitability. And then Robert Kirkman starts getting inter- really interesting and going, I'm going to create some real fucked up people for them to meet along the way. Mm. And then, then it starts. The joy starts to come from that in terms of the creative side of it. The TV series loses that massively because it, it then each series adapts a volume of the graphic novel but stretches it out way beyond its actual life. Um, 
and, and kind of kills it. The video game, this is the point we're coming to, <laughs> the video game is the closest I've ever felt to reading the comic yeah. for this for this in a different medium. Because, well, because it is, you know, explicitly based in the comic universe. Mm, right down to the art style. To the se- yeah, yeah, as opposed to the series universe. And as such, the sort of tonal differences between the series and the comic lean more towards the comic version, which kind of makes it feel more... just more comfortable, I mm. think. Especially you getting in the heads of, of Lee and... and, and there being a lot of conversational branch options to get to know your, the, you know your your convoy, to get to really know the people you end up travelling with, um, they give you so much opportunity to just talk and and hmm. and, and you know have conversations. Well, that's that's ninety percent of what the gameplay is. Yeah, and, and that that may sound boring, folks, but honestly, it ain't because navigating the conversations is like navigating the conversations with any group of people in real life how that conversation goes could have consequences um and you know so many video games are like oh you run over to someone and press talk and they say some things at you and then you move on <laughs> and that's it whereas in this it's like any conversation you enter to enter into could change the course of how things go when shit hits the fan again um you may have a friend after this conversation, you may have someone who want who thinks you're expendable. Yeah, and will let you be in the path of danger. Um, you can die <laughs> at certain port parts of the game, meaning that it then will reset and be like, try again from here. But that's more to do with physical actions when when the time arises. Um, and just like, I don't think I've ever been more kind of um, invested in a relationship in a video game as I had been with Lee I mean, yeah, that's, taking that's Clem the... on as his surrogate daughter. Yeah, that's the sort of... the sort of thing at the core of it that makes it so compelling is that relationship. And it's you don't get relationships like that written as well as they are in video games very often. So, it, it, well, you, I think you get more of them now. Mm-hmm. Because you've got that sort of parental now. as as a lot of like modern game developers have grown to the age where they've gone from being like young, like late teenagers or twenty somethings just getting into the industry to be like worrying on directing their own games and they've started and having children of their own and started to put that storytelling into games. Yeah. Like you saw most recently with the um, God of War. The Oh so don't, God you mean, of War. don't you mean Dad, Dad of Boy. Of, yeah. yeah. Um <laughs> Like so, this was kind of the sort of the precursor to that, or the sort of the forerunner of that sort of wave of of narratives in games, and I think it was so refreshing is the wrong word because you know there's nothing refreshing about The Walking Dead, but um, well, to be fair, at the time different. of this game's release, it was, release, it was yeah. still fairly a new franchise worldwide. Like it wasn't a no, but I mean, refreshing has a positive connotation that doesn't really fit oh, well. This is only about yeah. zombies. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> it was refreshing in the same way watching a horror movie to relax was. It was like, you know what? This is what I'm out. This is what I'm up for. This is the tone I'm going for tonight. Yeah, let's do it. But I know what you mean. It wasn't like you came out of it going, oh, I needed that. <laughs> you come out of it going, fuck. I hope they're going to be all right in the next chapter. <laughs> Good lord. Um, how about you? What what uh, what story? What story? Heavier story like games. Um, tickled your pickle, boyo, and and for why? It's a much longer form story, but seeing as it's just been re-released, it always comes to mind, and that's the Mass Effect trilogy. Yes, I was just about to say. Yeah. So it's it's so much longer and deeper than um, something like The Walking Dead, but it is a. You can tell that they didn't. That they changed stuff along the way. They didn't necessarily stick to the plan they originally had. Yeah. But there's enough of what eventually happens in the third game, foreshadowed in the first game, that it yeah. it, it all fits together. And they, they just... had they had a they had a hole of walls with uh, a, a wall of holes with specific yeah. shapes, and they built the blocks to go through those holes. Yeah. And they waggled them in your face, and then went, "We'll get there." Yeah, we'll get there. And then they did um, get there. <laughs> it's sort of a the sort of a side effect of having such a broad set of games that give you so many choices means that a lot all of those choices 
factor into the third game in a satisfactory way. So it's not like they did it perfectly, but mm-hmm. it's still at its core a really compelling story about a space dude, a space dude or dudette, and their sort of cadre of cool other space people who saved the galaxy. Like that's how, exactly how you saved the galaxy is kind of up to the player, but yeah. they make a lot of those characters so engaging and likable that you kind of forgive a lot of the the missed opportunities in the narrative here and there. Um, and having that, you know, stretching it out over what, I think it was like seven years from, from one to three, um, just lets them really let you sort of bathe in it. And I think that's why Andromeda wasn't a success in the way that they wanted it to be. Yeah. Because it, yeah, because the, well, the way that they finished. Y'all guys, y'all guys like the traversing, the uh, traversing uh, lunar surface uh, in vehicles shit from the first game. I mean, <laughs> like it wasn't the best thing. Here's more of it. No, more also, of that. Also characters you've never met or care about. <laughs> the Mako is not the best thing about the first one. I've got, I've got to admit. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the it's just Andromeda for me. The reason I never even bothered with it was just like Mass Effect is about Commander Shepard and his team and the people yeah. he meets along the way, or she meets along the way. Um, it's not about it's not about this. It's not about the technology. It's not about the aesthetics. It's about Commander Shepard and the Torians and the Citadel and the Asari and this sort of really, really well fleshed out galaxy of alien races and cultures and characters from those cultures that are not just, this is our culture and the hat we wear. And this is the only thing that we do. Um, There is a degree of that, but it's, it's a, it's a bit more nuanced than something like your average Star Trek episode. Yeah. Um, And it just, it, 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 it just crafts a really compelling narrative over three massive games. And, you know, people have problems with the ending. I was mostly okay with it, even before the sort of director's cut expanded it with a bit more sort of uh, clarification on what exactly is going on. Hmm. Um, but I was I was kind of okay with the original version of the ending. Um, certainly more okay with it than than some. Um, so, you know, for whatever it sort of fails to do, I think it succeeds at doing so much more in giving you a, you know, a trilogy of adventures that all follow the same narrative that all, that just let you get really invested in the people Yeah, at the centre of them. And while still allowing you to have a lot of freedom in the way that you play that central role, um... Yeah, I just think it's it's really... I think the Mass Effect trilogy is, is something that they should have left alone. I don't think they should have done Andromeda, and I don't think they... I know they're talking about doing another one somehow following on from the events of Mass Effect 3, which if you finish Mass Effect 3, you're like, how? Um, and why? How and why? <laughs> how how and why? Um, so I, I... I think they should leave it... Al- as, as a trilogy, I think it encapsulates so much good stuff that why would you carry on with it? Just let it, just let it be its thing. Well, you know why they carry on with it because it's EA and they love money, but yeah. it's, it's only ever going to be diminishing returns because you've made something that was so strong that to, that to, to sort of add to it is only going to diminish it. And I think, and there was definitely a period where every game was a trilogy yeah, and Mass Effect sort of is sort of the one that came out of that more or less unscathed. Like EA tried it with Dead Space as like this is our other sci-fi trilogy, and the third part was almost universally reviled, not even because of its story, but because of its mechanics. Yeah, um, and also means that it was left on a cliffhanger that is probably never going to get resolved. Um, yeah, and yeah. Yeah. But but then but you could take the first Dead Space out of that and okay, this is a really good story on its own. Um and Dead Space Two is a really good continuation of that, but because Dead Space Two sort of leaves you wandering into Dead Space Yeah, I I don't know. Dead Dead Space is one of those that almost makes it into this. 
But I think three fumbled so hard. Yeah. And and, and also just that I think part of it's also due to just like that the knowledge of the industry and their motivation for it. Yeah, too. yeah. Like, no, you can totally. tell you can tell with Mass Effect at the very least that like because they made you know <laughs> square hole yeah. And put it to, put it aside for a later chapter, for a final chapter, and then game one was, oh look at this square peg. Like it felt like there was a big there was a plan. There was yeah. a beginning, middle end to that story. That plan clearly changed along the way, and even up to the like the final, you know, days of the game's development stuff was changing. But I mean they they changed the square, they tilted it yeah. to its side to become a, a diamond hole. But, but enough peg, of it was the peg there. Still fit, that... You just had to wiggle it a different way <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> these metaphors God make damn. sense i'm sure yeah they make sense to me um so yeah there was a lot there, that was kind of the main thing with mass effect also the fact but, that your choices carry over like yes it, it's it's not just a story you're being led through it is a story that you are actively participating in and even yeah. though there are certain things you cannot change key beats the way you get there is very much dictated by the choices you make. Yeah. Um, which just it also gives you more emotional investment. Like, go, going back to what I said yes. about Walking Dead, like, having conversations and really getting into them makes you emotionally invest in your characters way more. Because you get to which learn is where... what your character's like in a more li- narratively linear game. Yeah. You get to learn what your character's like based on how they interact with other people. In this, in this uh, instance, Mass Effect, you get to know what your character's like because you kind of decide what they're like as yeah you, you build as their you personality as you go through yeah absolutely yeah um, um, and then the save files carrying through yeah helps massively like oh you played the first one the second game knows you played the first one and those choices will continue into the second one yeah and say I'm gonna pick up one. that remaster re-release at some point because because play, playing them on the PS3 <laughs> is is rough yeah now. It's, it's not it's not easy particularly that first one it's it's aged. Oh yes. It could do. It could do with a lick of paint and a bit of a tune up. Bit of a. Um, a little bit of a. But yeah, I, and I think. But I think that sort of investment in in characters is where these kind of games live or die because there are games that style themselves as this that completely fail to invest you in the characters either through poor writing or poor characterization mm. or just being generally poor games. I'm looking at you, Heavy Rain. Um, that just. <laughs> I mean, revolutionary in some ways, but ultimately you come out the back of it going... Revolutionarily bullshit is what it is. Ultimately you come out the back of it going, I think that was cool. That's I, it. No, That's all no, I, I have to say. Well, no, no, I didn't. Key, keyword, think. <laughs> I think that was I cool. I didn't think it was cool. I why it was, was it? Dumb. Why was it played straight except that one guy had sci-fi hologram glasses? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Can we yep. not have just had that? And they went, "We hear you." And they went on to create other stuff. It kind of, it kind of makes me want to try be Detroit Become Human because that can only be weirder. Um, oh yeah, that from what I, I have that, and from what I know, I've not played it yet. It is very much a we embrace the fucking weirdness of this. Yeah, I got it as a plus game a while back, so I could give it a go at some point, definitely. You could spin that bad boy. Um, uh, if you want to talk about something where the story and the writing and the performances really do all work in tandem, and also like this is the closest um, one we've picked so far to like a film or a miniseries, because to play it from start to finish is only roughly about if you plow through it about five hours max. Mm-hmm. Um, and we play this one together. Uh, Firewatch. Yes, of course. Oh shit, Firewatch. Well, I think Firewatch is sort of emblematic of the whole walking simulator subgenre, hmm. uh, which is a sometimes seen as a sort of a bit of a derogatory title, but yeah, it's so it, 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 it seems like it seems like a genre that would have benefited from being VR before VR was an option for everyone, like maybe their longevity or or or, or the 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 um, kind of respect for them overall would be higher had they all come out in tandem with the option to play things on a headset that immersed you in a world because at least then the yeah. walking simulator is you being in these beautifully realized environments that you feel like you're physically in uh, but i think firewatch kind of escaped the stigma of a lot of that era just because of the performances and the the structuring of the plot like i mean we we played um Everyone's gone to the Rapture, for example. Yes. Which, which again is is gorgeous and and really interesting and 
it was only really on my second playthrough of it that I kind of properly acknowledged the genius of the story that was laid out. But that we played it before its first patch, which meant that when we played it, you moved very fucking slowly through that world. Mm. Since you have the option to pick up the pace, you can hold down a button and move faster, which which helps the game flow much better because these areas are vast. But um, Firewatch always has stood out to me out of the walking sim kind of bracket because, I mean, by the end of that game, I felt like we intimately knew Henry, the protagonist, um, because we'd made choices for him. Um, yeah. But but they were they were never the like they were never easy choices ever no and that's part of the the setup of that game is it like oh so i'm going to play a, 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 a woodland ranger who occupies a firewatch uh, tower for a few months this will be cute and the first thing you hit with is here's how you fall in love here's how you meet your wife here's where she starts to get ill here's where the early onset dementia kicks in here's the decision you've got to make <laughs> it's like wait hmm. What? No? And then, and now you're doing this job. Are you doing this job because you need a distraction to move on? Are you doing this job because you feel like you've abandoned her and you're trying not to think on it? Are you doing this job to try and forget the life you have back home, despite the fact you know you can't? And then you meet this, like, wonderful person who you never actually meet. Um, no, no. With, with Delilah, who who is like the head of the Firewatch in that area, and she's the one checking in on you and all the others. And what follows is just this beautiful story of like a month, uh, well, a couple months. Um, oh, it's nearly a year actually. Yeah, because it, it sort of skips time every now and again. Um, of 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 you working in this woodland and walkie talking with you know Delilah. And your relationship progressing whilst trying to solve the mystery of some uh, missing uh, missing teenager and possible bear attacks and somebody you keep seeing like looking at you from atop the cliffs and it's like remember when we played it we were like what genre is this and they sort of they sort of deliberately don't tell you really what genre it yeah. is yeah because I think they want you on your toes because there are certainly elements of of horror. Yeah, it, 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 it teases that it's going to be some kind of horror game. Yeah. And it's just, it's not that at all. No, and to but, tell you that, gentle listener, is not to take away how tense and creepy it can get. Because oh, it's yeah, still no, it, tense it, and creepy. It knows how to switch atmospheres uh, yeah. very well, I think. And, uh, you know, that it's... I, oh, I don't want to say too much more, really, other than just, like, if you've not played Firewatch and you have the means, like, you have PlayStation or an Xbox or, or Steam... Give it a go. Like, really do give it a go. Um and since the since the second patch for bug fixes, there's five extra achievements because they've put a few extra little things to find in there for anyone That's who's neat. going back on a replay. Including yeah. a turtle. Yeah. You can find you can find a turtle and take it back and keep it in a shoebox home in your cabin. That's that's too cute. That's too <laughs> that's too cute. I'm going to die. <laughs> it's really adorable. Um so, yeah, I mean that that's that that is one story game where like I've played it th- all the way through twice, and I have every desire to revisit it again at some point because it just yeah. it. Well, that's that's sort of the difference between one of the big difference between movies and video games is movies you want to revisit because you want to experience that narrative over again, whereas video games you usually want to re- revisit because you want to experience the mechanics of it again. So I think yeah. that games. Where that sort of marry both of those feelings, um, for me like Mass Effect does, for you like Firewatch does. I think they're the sort of rare examples of it really done properly and really done well. Um, and I think they should be lauded and not necessarily imitated because some of the imitations have been pale, shall we say? Oh yeah. Um, one one more from one more from me. Uh, yeah. The reason why I mean, we even started this discussion is because I played the first Life is Strange last yes. year, finally. Which I've heard amazing things about, not, oh not just my from God. you. And I mean, there's 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 five entries in, in the series. Um, Life is Strange, Life is Strange Before the Storm, which is a prequel centering on one of the characters from Life is Strange. It's sort of a shorter one. Um, 
The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit, which is like an hour and a half long uh, sort of demo, essentially, for Life is Strange 2, but it's a separate story yeah. with a different character. Yeah. That if you play and then play Life is Strange 2, it just makes one of the episodes where that character is involved extra rewarding. Um, and plays as a fun prequel if you're going to box set them because there's things in it where later on when you play the main game, you're like, oh, that was hinting at this and that was teasing us about this being an element in the mm-hmm. story. And and it's uh, it's fun for that. And then Life is Strange 2, which I just finished. but uh, and, and then coming out... Um, I think it's I think it's on for later this year. Might be next year, but uh, is Life is Strange: True Colors, which will be the first uh, current generation and previous generation title. Yeah. Um, which will be focusing on again a brand new character and a brand new pa- uh, superpower, and it's th- these games are like indie darling as fuck in the best way. Oh yeah, like, no, totally. <laughs> the absolute best way. But it all starts with the Mac Daddy, or rather the Max Daddy, of uh, Life is Strange. Mac Caulfield goes back to Arcadia Bay, her hometown from when she was a kid, to study at the prestigious Blackwell Academy on the photography course, because that's what she aspires to be. Um, on, like, day one, everything's fine. She's living back there. This is great. Living in the dorms. Uh, this girl's a bit of a bitch. That guy's a bit of a twat. She seems sweet. He seems nice. The teacher's kind of hot. This is cool. La la la. And then she randomly turns back time. And doesn't know how the hell it happened. But suddenly she's like a minute earlier than she was. And she's like, maybe I just dozed off. She goes to the bathroom. And uh, while she's in the girl's bathroom, a girl called Chloe, who she grew up with, was her best friend as a child. And uh, the school prick, Nathan Prescott, barge in nathan's harassing chloe about something he pulls a gun on her and he shoots her dead max screams and suddenly it's a minute ago before they enter the bathroom so max intervenes and stops chloe from being shot and then they reconnect and the game is the story of max learning how to control what she seemingly is able to do yeah um whilst reconnecting with her childhood best friend and trying to help her, her, Chloe, find her friend Rachel, who has, in the year prior to the events, gone missing. Uh-huh. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a investigative sort of whodunit with the added element of time travel. Um, that's what One half of the appeal is that. The idea that you can have conversations with people to try and find information... If they're cold and don't give you the right response, you can then just rewind time 30 seconds and steer the conversation the other way to learn what you can. Or you learn about something that you know will arise suspicion, but you need to know, rewind time, and then don't bring it up the second time because yeah. you already know what you need to go and find or who you need to go and talk to from the alternate timeline conversation you had moments ago. Um so that's fun and the way that time travel is utilized and the consequences of it is a big push for for where the narrative goes and 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 how gripping that can be but the main pull again is just the relationships that world the the depth and and amount of things you can interact with and explore like you enter a dorm room like your own one of your classmates you could be in there for 20 minutes looking at all of the stuff that is interact like interactive you can pop onto a laptop and check their tabs you can go through the bookshelf and see what books there are you do you know what i mean you can yeah. really learn about people diary entries like if, if you enjoy a game where you can really get to reading this is one if you don't probably not for you you could play it without reading every document you find but if you don't read every document you find you're going to find some choices in the story a little harder to make because you didn't do the reading. Um, it pays to be investigative in this game. Um, yeah. Max is a wonderful character who is like, she deals with like anxiety and um, she feels very kind of uh, small. She feels yeah. like a very small fish in a very, very big pond. And the only person who kind of instills a sense of confidence in her is Chloe. But that's a bridge you have to mend because as far as Chloe's concerned, you fucked off out of town when we were kids and you never came back. So you've got to rebuild that. 
Chloe's one of the most like like lovable and endearing badasses in all of gaming. She's a proper little punk sod. Like her mum Joyce is a delight. Her stepdad David is an arsehole. Um there are there are heroes, there are villains, uh there's an adorably like lilting indie soundtrack. Yeah. Um it's just <clears throat> it is a delightful experience from start to finish until the finish where you have some tough choices to make. Uh I don't want to say too much really in terms of plot details beyond what what I've already said, which is like the trailer content for the mm. setup for the game, but like not for the faint of heart. No. This game goes into some very scary territory. Like, proper real world, holy crap, is this a horror now? I think it's a horror. I didn't expect this to be a horror territory. Um, it It is, uh, it is, it, yeah, it is difficult. But as we've discussed today with a lot of the things we've talked about, sometimes yeah. the best stuff... It's kind of tough to get through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because it's worth it by the end. It's absolutely worth it. I, life is, for me, as far as like narrative games where like, I invest my time, uh, my, my, I can't recommend Life is Strange enough. Like that's the one for me. And, and Before the Storm gives you a bit more of that world with one of those characters. Uh, it's not, you know, not the same level, but it's not meant to be. It's, Did you like that? Well, here's like the prequel comic book series like addition yeah you know what i mean it's, it's it's extra extra content extra um, stuff yeah there is a comic book as well um which I've, I've 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 been meaning to pick up at some point when i get like my next paycheck maybe i'll maybe i'll do it but um it's uh it, it, <laughs> the comic book series is based off of one of the endings of the game like oh like you made that choice cool Here's how it plays out. You didn't make that choice. Great. Here's a story about what would have happened had you made that choice. So like, there's still you know kind of options to explore. Um, yeah, it's it's and, and it seems like the main entries, Life is Strange, Life is Strange Two, and True Colors are an anthology. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The the only similar trait is that there appears to be there's someone with a superpower in each chapter yes and i and i hope they never explain that uh, so far there isn't a single bit of anything to explain why some people have powers and i hope it is never explained because it would just take away what is so wonderful about this um uh because sometimes magic shit is just more fun for being magic shit yeah like, yeah it's fair. fairy tales would suck if people walked in suddenly were like hey goldilocks just so you know three bears own this house now you might be wondering why these bears stand upright wear clothes uh have a house uh well we're going to explain it. it's like no fuck no <laughs> no we don't need this we don't need this the story works as it is um so yeah life is strange is absolutely mine yeah uh do you do you have one more you want to chalk in? Or no, I think I think, uh, do you think it's time to open the floor. As it, were? I think you've explored this sort of subgenre more than I have. I'm definitely a, a I like a good story. I love a good story, but I'm very much a mechanical guy when it comes mechanical to mechanical boy. I, it's the mechanics that that keep me coming back to stuff more than uh, the story. So I think this is more your oeuvre than mine. You're um, a whimsy yeah, boy. By all means, open it to the floor, Christopher. You bastards! Are there any that we've missed that you think we should play? Uh, without going into spoilers, because, you know, you want folks to play the games you want to play without ruining it for them before they play it. Mm. Uh, got any recommendations? We want to know all about them. You can email bigdamncontact at gmail.com or you can tweet them to us at bigdamncast if you can fit it into a tweet thread. Uh, by the way, Matt plays games on Fridays. It's I the do. Big Damn well, stream. I might have to change that, but I'll keep you updated Ooh. on Twitter. Keep posted, folks. Twitch.tv yeah. slash big damn stream. If you follow twitch.tv slash big damn stream, regardless of what day they end up moving to, you're not going to miss them. So no, you're not. give it you're a follow and turn on your notifications, you little shits. Uh, and if you want to help us keep the lights on, because believe it or not, hosting a podcast costs money on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, not, it's not, uh, it's, it's not free. It's not a free, it's not a freebie, folks. Uh, you can help us at patreon.com slash big damn cast. Chuck us a few shekels. You get a couple of little cheeky rewards for your troubles. Uh, based on which tier you pick, you get some extra big rewards, you chunky boys. Um, 
Speaking of chunky boys, Matt and I are heading off now. Not together. Although we no. did spend time physically together yesterday, yes. which was it bloody was lovely. lovely. I sat in proximity to him and I breathed near him knowing yeah. that uh, he's full of the vaccine. Full of. I'm so, like full of va- I'm so full of vaccine. I'm so full of vaccine. You like just chug vaccine. You just take it in shot glasses every day. You just up, up to my shit. eyeballs in vaccine. Just chugging on that Bluetooth. Um, oh yeah. Bluetooth compatibility. Tell me uh, more about the Bluetooth. I'm getting my I'm getting my first one uh, on Friday when this Yeah, boy. Out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and I'm working from home for the rest of the day. So based on how I react to it, uh, it's either going to be a relatively normal day where I just happen to get a jab in the morning. Or uh, I'm going to be like, yeah, guys, I'm clocking in, but just so you know, <laughs> I, I am I'm not actively participating in any Zoom no. meetings today. <laughs> like, no, thank you. I will, I'll be in the IM. I'll be in the IM. I'll type along. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how we go. But until then, uh, quick, let's take a word each and come up with an inspirational out for the episode. Remember... Remember... The fifth of January. It's a day for touching my shining dingus. We got there. It's against the terms of service, but we made it. Hey! Bye, fuckers! See ya.